Part 7 Karenin's Smile 1. The window lo looked out on a slope overgrown with the crooked bodies of apple trees. The woods cut off the view above the slope and a crooked line of hills stretched into the distance. When towards evening a white moon made its way into the pale sky, Teresa would go and stand on the threshold. The sphere hanging in the not yet darkened sky seemed like a lamb they had forgotten to turn off in the morning, a lamb that had burned all day in the room of the dead. None of the crooked apple trees growing along the slope could ever leave the spot where it had put down its roots, just as neither Teresa nor Tomas could ever leave their village. They had sold their car, their television set, and their radio to buy a tiny cottage and garden from a farmer who was moving to town. Life in the country was the only scape open to them, because only in the country was there a constant deficit of people and a surplus of living accommodation. No one bothered to look into the political past of people willing to go off and work in the fields or woods. No one envied them. Teresa was happy to abandon the city, the drunken bar flies molesting her, and the anonymous women leaving the smell of their groins in, in Tomash's hair. The police stopped pestering them, and the incident when the engineer so merged with the scene on Petron Hill that she was hard put to tell which was the dream and which the truth. Was the engineer in fact employed by the secret police? Perhaps he was. Perhaps not. Men who use borrowed flats for rendezvous and never make love to the same woman twice are not so rare. Are not so rare. In any case, Teresa was happy and felt that she had at last reached her goal. She and Tomas were together and alone. Alone? Let me be more precise. Living alone meant breaking with all their former friends and acquaintances cutting their life into two like a ribbon. However, they felt perfectly at home in the company of the country people they worked with, and they sometimes exchanged visits with them. The day they met the chairman of the local collective farm at the spa that had Russian street names, Teresa discovered in herself a picture of country life originating in memories of books she had read or in her ancestors. It was a harmonious world, Everyone came together in one big happy family with common interests and routines, church services on Sundays, and a tavern where the men could get away from their women folk, and a hall in the tavern where a band played on Saturdays and the villagers danced. Under communism, however, village life no longer fit the age-old pattern. The church was in the neighboring village and no one went there. The tavern had been turned into offices, so the men had nowhere to meet and drink beer, the young people nowhere to dance. Celebrating church holidays was forbidden and no one cared about their secular replacements. The nearest cinema was in town 15 miles away. So at the end of a day's work filled with boisterous shouting and relaxed chatter, they would all shut themselves up within their four walls and surrounded by contemporary furniture emanating bad taste like a cold drought, stare at the refulgent, refulgent television screen. They, they never paid one another visits besides dropping in on a neighbor for a word or two before supper. They all dreamed of moving into town. The country offered them nothing in the way of an even of even a minimally interesting life. Perhaps it was the fact that no one wished to settle there that caused the state to lose its power over the countryside. A farmer who no longer owns his own land and is merely a laborer tilling the soil forms no allegiance to either region or work. He has nothing to lose, nothing to fear for. As a result of such apathy, the countryside had maintained more than a modicum of autonomy and freedom. The chairman of the collective farm was not brought in from outside, as were all high-level managers in the city. He was elected by the villagers from among themselves.
Because everyone wanted to leave, Teresa and Tomas were in an exceptional position. They had come voluntarily. If other villagers took advantage of every opportunity to make day trips to the surrounding towns, Teresa and Tomas were content to remain where they were, which meant that before long, they knew the villagers better than the villagers knew one another. The collective farm chairman became a truly close friend. He had a wife, four children, and a pig he raised like a dog. The pig's name was Mephisto, and he was the pride and main attraction of the village. He would answer his master's call and was always clean and pink. He paraded about on his hoofs like a heavy-thighed woman in high heels. When Karenin first saw Mephisto, he was very upset and circled him, sniffing for a long time. But he soon made friends with him, even to the point of preferring him to the village dogs. Indeed, he had nothing but scorn for the dogs, because they were all chained to their dog houses and never stopped their silly, unmotivated barking. Karenin correctly assessed the value of being one of a kind, and I can state without compunction that he greatly appreciated his friendship with the pig. The chairman was glad to be able to help his former surgeon, though at the same time sad that he could do nothing more. Tomash became the driver of the pickup truck that took the farm workers out to the fields and hauled the equipment. The collective farm had four large cow sheds as well as a small stable of 40 heifers. Teresa was charged with looking after them and taking them out to pasture twice a day because the closer, easily accessible meadows would eventually be mowed she had to take her herd into the surrounding hills for grazing, gradually moving farther and farther out, and in the course of a year, covering all the pasture land round about. As in her small town youth, she was never without a book, and the minute she reached the day's pasture, she would open it and read. Karenin always kept her company. He learned to bark at the young cows when they got too frisky and tried to go off on their own. He did so with obvious zest. He was definitely the happiest of the three. Never before had his position as a keeper of the cloth been so respected. The country was no place for improvisation. The time in which Teresa and Tomas lived was growing closer to the regularity of his time. One day after lunch, at a time when they both had an hour to themselves, they took a walk with Karenin up the slope behind the cottage. I don't like the way he's running, said Teresa. Karenin was limping on a hind leg. Tomash bent down and carefully felt all along it. Near the hawk he found a small bump. The next day he sat him in front of the seat of the pickup and drove during his rounds to the neighboring village where the local vet veterinarian lived. A week later, he paid him another visit. He came home with the news that Karenin had cancer. Within three days, Tomash himself with the vet in attendance had operated on him. When Tomash brought him home, Karenin had not quite come out of the anesthesia. He lay on the rug next to the bed with his eyes open, whimpering his thigh-shaved bear and the incision and six stitches painfully visible. At last he tried to stand up. He failed. Teresa was terrified that he would never walk again. Don't worry, said Tomas. He's still under the anesthetic. She tried to pick him up, but he snapped at her. It was the first time he'd ever tried to bite Teresa. He doesn't know who you are, said Tomas. He doesn't recognize you. They lifted him onto their bed, where he quickly fell asleep, as did they. At three o'clock that morning, he suddenly woke them up, wagging his tail and climbing all over them, curling up to them, unable to have his fill. It was the first time he'd ever got them up, too. He had always waited until one of them woke up before he dared jump on them. But when he suddenly came into the middle of the night, he could not control himself. Who can tell what distance he covered on his way back? Who knows what phantoms he battled? 
and now that he was at home with his dear ones, he felt compelled to share his overwhelming joy, a joy of return and rebirth. 2. The very beginning of Genesis tells us that God created man in order to give him dominion over fish and fowl and all creatures. Of course, Genesis was written by a man, not a horse. There is no certainty that God actually did grant man dominion over, the, over other creatures. What seems more likely, in fact, is that man invented God to sanctify the dominion that he had usurped for himself over the cow and the horse. Yes, the right to kill a deer or a cow is the only thing all of mankind can agree upon, even during the bloodiest of wars. The reason we take that right for granted is that we stand at the top of the hierarchy. But let a third party enter the game, a visitor from another planet, for example, someone to whom God says, Thou shalt have dominion over creatures of all other stars, and all at once taking Genesis for granted becomes problematical. Perhaps a man hitched to the cart of a Martian or roasted on the spit by inhabitants of the Milky Way will recall the veal cutlet he used to slice on his dinner plate and apologize belatedly to the cow. Walking along with heifers, driving them in front of her, Teresa was constantly obliged to use discipline because young cows are frisky and like to run off into the fields. Kernan kept her company. He had been going along daily to the pasture with her for two years. He always enjoyed being strict with the heifers, barking at them, asserting his authority. His God had given him dominion over cows, and he was proud of it. Today, however, he was having great trouble making his way and hobbled along on three legs. The fourth had a wound on it, and the wound was festering. Teresa kept bending down and stroking his back. Two weeks after the operation, it became clear that the cancer had continued to spread and that Kernan would fare worse and worse. Along the way, they met a neighbor who was hurrying off to a cow shed in her rubber boots. The woman stopped long enough to ask, What is wrong with the dog? It seems to be limping. He has cancer, said Teresa. There is no hope. And the lump in her throat kept her from going on. The woman noticed Teresa's tears and nearly lost her temper. Good heavens! Don't tell me you're going to bawl your head off over a dog. She was not being vicious. She was a kind woman and merely wanted to comfort Teresa. Teresa understood and had spent enough time in the country to realize that if the local inhabitants loved every rabbit as she loved Kernan, they would be unable to kill any of them, and they and their animals would soon starve to death. Still, the woman's words struck her as less than friendly. I understand, she answered without protest, but quickly turned her back and went her way. The love she bore her dog made her feel cut off, isolated. With a sad smile, she told herself that she needed to hide it more than she, had, she would an affair. People are indignant at the thought of someone loving a dog. But if the neighbor had discovered that Teresa had been unfaithful to Tomas, she would have given Teresa a playful pat on the back, back as a sign of secret solidarity. Be that, be that as it may, Teresa continued on her path, and watching her heifers rub against one another, she thought what nice animals they were. Calm, guileless, and sometimes childishly animated, they looked like fat 50-year-olds pretending they were 14. There was nothing more touching than cows at play. Teresa took pleasure in their antics and could not help thinking, it is an idea that kept coming back to her during her two years in the country, that man is as much a parasite on the cow as the tapeworm is on man. We have sucked their udders like leeches. Man, the cow parasite, is probably how non-man defines man in his zoology books. <laughs>
Now we may treat this definition as a joke and dismiss it with a condescending laugh, but since Teresa took it seriously, she found herself in a precarious position. Her ideas were dangerous and distanced her from the rest of mankind. Even though Genesis says that God gave man dominion over all animals, we can also construe it to mean that he merely entrusted them to man's care. Man was not the planet's master, merely its administrator, and therefore eventually responsible for his administration. Descartes took a decisive step forward. He made man mate et propriétaire de, de la nature. And suddenly, and surely, there is a deep connection between that step and the fact that he was also the one who point-blank denied animals a soul. Man is master and proprietor, says Descartes, whereas the beast is merely an automaton, an animated machine, a machina animata. When an animal laments, it is not a lament, it is merely the rasp of a poorly functioning mechanism. When a wagon wheel grates, the wagon is not in pain, it simply needs oiling. Thus we have no reason to grieve for a dog being carved up alive in the laboratory. While the heifers grazed, Teresa sat on a stump with Kernan at her side, his head resting in her lap. She recalled reading a two-line a two-line filler in the papers ten or so years ago about how about how all the dogs in, cer in a certain Russian city had been summarily shot. It was, the inc it was that inconspicuous and seemingly insignificant little article that had brought home to her for the first time the sheer horror of her country's oversized neighbor. That little article was a premonition of things to come. The first years following the Russian invasion could not yet be characterized as a reign of terror because practically no one in the entire nation agreed with the occupation regime. The Russians had to ferret out the few expectations and push them into power. But where could they look? All faith in communism and love for Russia was dead. So they sought people who wished to get back at life for something, people with revenge on the brain. Then they had to focus cultivate and maintain those people's aggressiveness, give them a temporary substitute to practice on. The substitute they lit upon was animals. All at once the paper started coming out with the cycles of features and organized letters to the editors, campaigns demanding, for example, the extermination of all pigeons within city limits, and the pigeons would be exterminated but the major drive was directed against dogs. People were still disconsolate over the cat catastrophe of the occupation, but radio, television, and the press went on and on about dogs, how they soil our streets and parks, endanger our children's health, fulfill no useful function, yet must be fed. They whipped up such a psychotic fever that Teresa had been afraid that the crazed mob would do harm to Karenin. Only after a year did the accumulated malice, which until then had been vented, for the sake of training on animals, find its true goal, people. People started being removed from their jobs, arrested, put on trial. At last the animals could breathe freely. Teresa kept stroking Karenin's head, which was quietly resting in her lap, while, while something like the following ran through her mind. There is no particular merit in being nice to one's fellow man. She had to treat the other villagers decently, because otherwise she couldn't live there. Even with Tomas, she was obliged to behave lovingly because she needed him. We can never establish with certainty what part of our relations with others is the result of our emotions, love, antipathy, charity, or malice. And what part is predetermined by constant power play among individuals? True human goodness in all its purity and freedom can come to the fore only when its recipient has no power. Mankind's true moral test its fundamental test, which lies deeply buried from view, consists of its gratitude towards those who are at its mercy.
animals. And in this respect, mankind has suffered a fundamental debacle, a debacle so fundamental that all others stem from it. One of the heifers had made friends with Teresa. The heifer would stop and stare at her with her big brown eyes. Teresa knew her. She called her Marqueta. She would have been happy to give her give all her heifers names, but she was unable to. There were too many of them. Not so long before, forty years or so, all the cows in the village had names. And if having a name is a sign of having a soul, I can say that they had souls despite Descartes. But then the villages were turned into a large collective factory and the cows began spending all their lives in the five square feet set aside for them in their cow sheds. From that time on, they, had, they have had no names and became mere machinae animatae. The world has proved Descartes correct. Teresa keeps appearing before my eyes. I see her sitting on the stump, petting, petting Karenin's head and ruminating on mankind's debacles. Another image also comes to mind. Nietzsche leaving his hotel in Turin. Seeing a horse and a coachman beating it with a whip, Nietzsche went up to the horse and before the coachman's very eyes, put his arms around the horse's neck and burst into tears. That took place in 1889 when Nietzsche too had removed himself from the world of people. In other words, it was at the time when his mental illness had just erupted. But for that very reason, I feel his gesture has broad implications. Nietzsche was trying to apologize to the horse for Descartes. His lunacy that is, his final break with mankind began at the very moment he burst into tears over the horse. And that is the Nietzsche I love, just as I love Teresa with the mortally ill dog resting his head in her lap. I see them one next to the other, both stepping down from the road along which mankind, the master and proprietor of nature, marches onward. Three. Karenin gave birth to two rows and a bee. He stared, amazed at his own progeny. The rows were utterly serene, but the bee staggered about as if drugged, then flew up and away. Or so it happened in Teresa's dream. She told it to Tomas the minute he woke up, and they both found a certain consolation in it. It transformed Karenin's illness into a pregnancy and the drama of giving birth into something both laughable and touching, two rows and a bee. She again fell prey to illogical hopes. She got out of bed and put on her clothes. Here too, her day began with a trip to the shop for milk, bread, rolls. But when she called Karenin for his walk that morning, he barely raised his head. It was the first time that he had refused to take part in the ritual he himself had forced upon them. She went off without him. Where's Karenin? asked the woman behind the counter who had Karenin's roll ready as usual. Teresa carried it home herself in her bag. She pulled it out and showed it to him while still in the doorway. She wanted him to come and fetch it, but he just lay there motionless. Tomas saw how unhappy Teresa was. He put the roll in his mouth and dropped down on all fours opposite Karenin. Then he slowly crawled up to him. Karenin followed him with his eyes, which seemed to show a glimmer of interest, but he did not pick himself up. Tomas brought his face right up to his muzzle. Without moving his body, the dog took the end of the roll sticking out of Tomash's mouth into his own. Then Tomash let go of his end so that Karenin could eat it all. Still on all fours, Tomash retreated a little, arched his back, and started yelping, making believe he wanted a fight over the roll. After a short while, the dog responded with some yelps of his own.
At last, what they were hoping for. Karenin feels like playing. Karenin hasn't lost the will to live. Those yelps were Karenin's smile, and they wanted it to last as long as possible. So Tomash crawled back to him and tore off the end of the roll sticking out of Karenin's mouth. Their faces were so close that Tomash could smell the dog's breath, feel the long hairs on Karenin's muzzle tickling him. The dog gave out another yelp and his mouth twitched. Now they each had half roll between their teeth. Then Karenin made an old tactical error. He dropped his half in the hope of seizing the half in his master's mouth, forgetting as always that Tomash was not a dog and had hands. Without letting his half of the roll out of his mouth, Tomash picked up the other half from the floor. Tomash, Teresa cried, you're not going to take his roll away from him, are you? Tomash laid both halves on the floor in front of Karenin, who quickly gulped down the first and held the second in his mouth for an ostentatiously long time, flaunting his victory over the two of them. Standing there watching him, they thought once more that he was smiling and that as long as he kept smiling, he had a motive to keep living despite his death sentence. The next day, his condition actually appeared to have improved. They had lunch. It was the time of day when they normally took him out for a walk. His habit was to start running back and forth between them restlessly. On that day, however, Teresa picked up the leash and collar only to, st to be stared at Dolly. They tried to look cheerful for and about him and pep him up a bit, and after a long wait, he took pity on them, tottered over on his three legs, and let her put on the collar. I know you hate the camera, Teresa said. I know you hate the camera, Teresa, said Tomash, but take it along today, will you? Teresa went and opened the cupboard to rummage for the long-abandoned, long-forgotten camera. One day, we'll be glad to have the pictures, Tomás went on. Karenin has been an important part of our life. What do you mean, has been, said Teresa, as if she had bitten by a snake. The camera lay directly in front of her on the cupboard floor, but she would not bend to pick it up. I won't take it along. I refuse to think about losing Karenin. And you refer to him in the past tense? I'm sorry, said Tomash. That's all right, said Teresa mildly. I catch myself thinking about him in the past tense all the time. I keep having to push it out of my mind. That's why I won't take the camera. They walked along in silence. Silence was the only way of not thinking about Karenin in the past. They did not let him out of their sight. They were with him constantly waiting for him to smile, but he did not smile. He merely walked with them, limping along on his three legs. He's just doing it for us, said Teresa. He didn't want to go for a walk. He's just doing it to make us happy. It was sad, what she said, yet without realizing it, they were happy. They were happy not in spite of their sadness, but thanks to it. They were holding hands and both had the same image in their eyes, a limping dog who represented 10 years of their lives. They walked a bit farther. Then to their great disappointment, Karenin stopped and turned. They had to go back. Perhaps that day, or perhaps the next, Teresa walked in on Tomash reading a letter. Hearing the door open, he slipped it in among some other papers, but she saw him do it. On her way out of the room, she also noticed him stuffing the letter into his pocket, but he forgot about the envelope. As soon as she was alone in the house, she studied it carefully. The address was written in an unfamiliar hand but it was very neat and she guessed it to be a woman's.
When he came back later, she asked him nonchalantly whether the mail had come. No, said Tomas, and filled Teresa with despair, a despair all the worse for her having grown unaccustomed to it. No, she did not believe he had a secret mistress in the village. That was all, all but impossible. She knew what he did with every spare minute. He must have kept up with a woman in Prague who meant so much to him that he thought of her even if she could no longer have leave the smell of her groin in his hair. Teresa did not believe that Tomas meant to leave her for the woman, but the happiness of their two years in the country now seemed besmirched by lies. An old thought came back to her. Her home was Kernan, not Tomas. Who would wind the clock of their days when he was gone? Transported mentally into the future, a future without Kernan, Teresa felt abandoned. Kernan was lying in a corner whimpering. Teresa went out into the garden. She looked down at a patch of grass between two apple trees and imagined Kernan there. She dug her heel into the earth and traced a rectangle in the grass. That was where his grave would be. What are you doing? Tomas asked, surprising her just as she had surprised him reading the letter a few hours earlier. She gave no answer. He noticed her hands trembling for the first time in many months. He grabbed hold of them. She pulled away from him. Is that a grave for Karenin? She did not answer. Her silence grated on him. He exploded. First you blame me for thinking of him in the past tense. And then what do you do? You go and make the funeral arrangements. She turned her back on him. Tomas retreated into his room, slamming the door behind him. Teresa went in and opened it. Instead of thinking about yourself all the time, you might at least have some consideration for him, she said. He was asleep until you woke him. Now he'll start whimpering again. She knew she was being unfair. The dog was not asleep. She knew she was acting like the most vulgar of women, the kind that is out to cause pain and knows how. Tomas tiptoed into the room where Kernan was lying, but she would not leave him alone with the dog. They both leaned over him, each from his own side. Not that there was a hint of reconciliation in the move. Quite the contrary, each of them was alone. Teresa with her dog, Tomas with his. It is thus divided, each alone, that sad to say they remained with him until his last hour.